Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Happy Friday and happy summer. <laughs> um, welcome to Emin and El Barrio Firehouse Community Media Center. If we haven't met, my name is Silvia um, Echeverria, manager at the Youth Media Center. Um, MNN is public access channel for Manhattan. We have five um, cable channels and we're dedicated to community media education. Um, at the Youth Media Center specifically, we work with youth ages 16 to 24, giving them access to technology and media making, as well as uh, critical thinking and social justice uh, issues and collaboration <laughs> on that. Um, today we're here for a special event. We are celebrating the first fellowship, uh, field fellowship at the Youth Media Center um, that we did this year. Um, yes, <laughs> big accomplishment. It, it was a really big step for us because it was um, providing the space for a, for a higher level of commitment of experience and of work to our youth producers. And um, I'm glad to share that there was a lot of applications that our youth were ready for the challenge. And, you know, as a, f as a first pilot, we obviously couldn't work with everyone at the same time, but it is my hope that, you know, this, this first opportunity leads to many other opportunities, um, you know, where, you know, mo more staff members are able to lead projects like this. Or even, you know, there's no need for a staff member, you know, to lead projects like this where the producers on their own can, you know, can take that lead and can take that step and say, I'm able to do this. Um, so I would like to just thank everyone that worked, um, you know, in this project. Brenda Leon, um, as, as leader of the, of the, of the team with Hu Ying. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, with the fellows Hu Ying, Aisha, and Ari. Um, congratulations and... And um, I just want to share that it was very jo joyful just to see you growing um, together as a team, you know, just seeing you here often and just, you know, talking to each other, uh, thinking with each other and, bu and building with each other. You know, that was evident for all of us that were around you. And, and it's just great to, to see how much you have grown. Like, I'm confident to say that you're not the person that you were eight weeks ago or nine weeks ago that you are, you know, in another state of mind, in another space, and that you have built something that, you know, you're going to take with you after you leave this space. So I congratulate you. I want to celebrate with you. And yeah, <laughs> so let's do it. So I want to introduce you to Brenda, who's going to talk to us a little bit about the project. So enjoy. All right, cool. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, I feel weird. It's a small group of us, but OK. Thank you all for coming out on a Friday. It's Friday, right? It's right. <laughs> Friday night. Um, so before we start, I want to recognize that we are standing on Lenape territory, uh, stolen territory, and that we must honor the land which we stand on um, so that we can begin conversations about food, um, that we can access uh, the food that nurtures us, the food that has been privatized or recreated to intoxicate us. So I think that that was a leading cause for um, starting this project and having these conversations with the youth specifically. Um, when we started this project eight weeks ago, we were like, well, they want more, right? <laughs> um, so just for, for folks who don't know, we run like a 10-week program with students who are interested in creating media. And from here, from those 10-week cycles, it's like, okay, so now what is the next step? So we were able to come up with this fellowship project along with another one for studio, and we're really excited to share about that. Um, so yeah, that's how this idea began, and also just taking walks in our neighborhood um, so that we can really start to recognize like why are there more liquor stores than there are supermarkets or healthy, cl healthy clinics, right? So obviously it's a, it's a large uh, topic that we couldn't uh, cover all in 10 minutes, but we've given our best, we've done great work. Uh, we were talking earlier upstairs in, in a very intimate space where we were able to come up uh, with our agreements and really honor those, right? Really honor the transparency and building together for the past eight weeks, really honor uh, making space, taking space, and trusting the process, most of all, I think, for um, anyone who's a creative or in any project that you lead, I think that that's very, very important when you are working with people who bring different strengths to the table. 
um, and really honoring that in a specific, like, what are you bringing? So, yeah, so we recognize uh, whose labor has built and fed this country throughout these conversations that we held, and we really went into, like, a reflection process when we started thinking about the interview questions and who we were going to even talk to. Um, so, yeah, so here is growth in our DNA. I hope you all enjoy. And we are going to have a, a little panel discussion with our fellows and really just celebrate their work throughout these eight weeks. So thank you all. Enjoy. So while we get sound ready, um, I'll just go ahead and introduce everybody. So we have Aisha Keita, um, an analytical researcher, creative writer, and communicator. Aisha is a, an East Harlem native by way of Mali. Um, Aisha has worked closely with East Harlem residents in documenting fears and dreams from the neighborhood, and she is currently attending Baruch College, where she is majoring in political science. Um, so yeah, Aisha. <laughs> so um, next we have Hui Ying, um, a creative writer, community artist, and organizer from New York City with roots in the Chinese diaspora. They have organized to fight gentrification in Manhattan's Chinatown and have traveled to eight countries around the world documenting stories of migration and resilience across the diaspora. So yeah, let's give it up for Hu Ying. And to my left, I have Ari Rain, um, artist, creator, and singer from Queens, New York. Ari is an all-around creative soul, former YC Weekly host. Um, Ari is a talented young person who works tirely, tirelessly to deconstruct gender roles and create music. She was a writer at Represent Magazine and is currently studying at Queens College, um, where she is taking up music production. So let's give it up for Ari. Hey. Awesome, so we're just gonna go um, and start with a couple of questions and then we'll open up, open it up to the audience. Um, so yeah, so we've been working, as we mentioned, for the past eight weeks and I think that I wanna start off with what does food justice mean to you? So whoever wants to take that up first. Not everyone at once. <laughs> um, food justice. I guess it's it's the ability to obtain healthy food um, because not everyone not everyone is uh, is guaranteed that mm. or have access to that and I think that's what made this project so important was because of that fact <laughs> so just uh, by spreading awareness of um, the injustices we'll be able to bring about uh, solutions solutions for change. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, I think that food justice also has a lot to do with education. Mm -hmm. So it's not just going out and eating healthier, it's educating our community members on the importance of healthy eating. Mm -hmm. um, and to add on to that, um, I would say for me, it's uh, looking at how food has been framed today as like organic food and whole foods, like being the healthy food that's expensive and like inaccessible, um, but then kind of like deconstructing that and thinking about how a lot of people in our communities, um, like we're farmers before coming to America for folks who an, are not indigenous um, to the Americas, um, and how like people grow food in their own gardens and all of that is organic, but it's not labeled as like healthy organic eating uh, for like these communities of color. Um, so like deconstructing all of that. So definitely deconstructing a lot. And that kind of leads on to my next question. Um, since those eight weeks, what has been the one thing that's been the most inspiring idea, experience, or action that you have learned from like interviewing um, Karen Washington and Francis? We also spoke to folks in, in La Finca del Sur. We couldn't put everyone on our <laughs> 10 minutes short, but um, yeah, that's my next question. I think the idea that we wound up using for our title, the fact that we have, uh, the fact that we, uh, people of color, originally have a history of, um, of agriculture, and uh, sustaining the land, and working the land, and bringing about uh, uh, fruits and vegetables, ba basically like manipulating their environment to sustain their community. And it's crazy, because we don't think about it like that. 
So when they had brought it up in the interviews, I was just like, wow, if we think back far enough, one of our ancestors used to work the land. Mm. They used to farm to provide for their families and for their community. Mm. And I never thought about it like that. Um, one thing that I learned is just that community gardens even exist. Like, mm. I live in Harlem, and I pass by them every day. I just thought they were somebody's private um, property or that we weren't allowed inside or that it was shut out from the actual world. But now, just learning this, I know that I can also take part in it and participate in community gardens. So just mm. knowing that is powerful enough for me. Uh, for me, it was like meeting people who I otherwise wouldn't have met if I didn't like purposely try to schedule an interview with them. And so <laughs> like seeing um, the difference between Francis, who is a young person doing this, um, and then Karen talking about how she wishes that um, that she was able to learn all of this beforehand, but like sharing, hearing all of her realizations now and then seeing Francis, uh, who's a lot younger, like share the same things was really impactful for me. And then just like hearing Francis talk about how she's from the South Bronx and wanted to leave at a point, but then came back and like to actually see her coming like every day, um, every weekend to be f gardening and farming um, in her own community and just like being committed to that um, was like really cool to see. Awesome, thank you. Um, my next question is, what were some of the most challenging tasks in putting together this short film? Psh, what? Uh, <laughs> we had um, a bunch of ideas and a lot of routes that we could have taken, but um, you had mentioned earlier that the biggest thing was trusting the process and uh, reviewing the evidence of certain things that we already had instead of trying to make it fit to what we w where we wanted it to go and how we wanted it to become. Um, so yeah, we had a bunch of ideas and how we wanted it to uh, end up, but it sort of made its own way. It uh, turned into its own thing. And once we let that rock, it all just came together. Definitely agree with Ari. I think that was one of the major ones. Just we had so much ideas, and just to end up going to community gardens, it was almost like it was meant to be. Like it just, it just took us there. Like the, the project just had its own way of going to that. Yeah, um, definitely. Like the trusting the process of um, creative projects and how we had originally planned to go to three different gardens in three different boroughs and talk to three different people. Um, and it all just like worked out really well. Um, and like during the whole process, we realized that uh, the film would take a different turn and perspective that worked out for the better. Awesome, thank you. Can I ask? Um, of course, yeah. Um, uh, so besides trusting the process, uh, we had come up with something in our uh, list of um, things to follow before we started the project. Mm -hmm. It was sort of like a, a community agreement. Yes, yeah. our community agreement. And um, we had this thing called a step up, step back. So um, for a while, we were sort of trying to organize it and all edit and all put our creative ideas. But when we were all together and we re realized uh, our strengths and our faults and we let everybody handle what they were good at, that's when it started working out the best, I feel like. And then everything just came together really fast. It did. <laughs> and um, yeah. Go ahead. yeah, just want to say that um, like the music, Ari produced it within a couple of days. Um, yeah, in like three days, he just like <laughs> produced it and like put it in there. Um, so yeah, there were just like so many incredible moments that we weren't planning or expecting, but that happened. Yeah, definitely. That's actually my next question. So yeah, so Ari um, produced the soundtrack uh, in the beginning and towards the end. So tell us a little bit about, you know, just combining the songs and combining like different hymns. Because originally we had thought of different hymns um, that people use to honor the land, right? So we talked a little bit about that. Um, when we were w working on the track, we had all like got together and threw out some ideas and things like that. Uh, this was this was after we we came up with the title. So we wanted something that would like relate to the title and relate to the theme of our project. 
And so we did start with hymns because we felt like that was um, very relevant and recent as well. Uh, if we found like a, a popular enough hymn that people knew and we included it in there, then maybe people would like sing along and they would they would be reminded of like olden times when when uh, colored people of this land actually tilled the soil and were forced to till the soil and things like that. But um, it didn't work out the way we had initially planned, like the rest of the documentary. Um, it was really funny because I, I know that like Huying and and uh, the the group we they they sort of wanted me to be on it, and after I wound up like putting everything together, it was just overproduced. Like I couldn't be on the track, so I was just <laughs> like, oh, forget it, just leave it like that. But then like when I when I was adding the um the other vocals, like the background vocals, and I was like messing with the time, and I was trying to like fix the tone and stuff like that. Like they wound up sounding like farm animals. <laughs> <laughs> so like the deeper tone sounds like a cow and like the higher tone sound like kind of sounds like a sheep and we were laughing at that for like <laughs> the last week <laughs> we were but i think it fits yeah we laughed so a lot. <laughs> <laughs> we laughed a lot awesome um and aisha you took up, up a lot of the research for the short film um so i know that you were sitting there like translating like really <laughs> dense data i should like i can't <laughs> no more <laughs> i can't can you tell us a little bit more about that yeah, it, it was definitely hard when you're researching and you have so much data, so much numbers. And at first, I didn't even understand this. So it's like I, I had to make it make sense to me before I could even translate it to make it make sense to somebody else. So that was definitely difficult. And um, just finding relevant data. Like at first, I remember that some of the data I found that I was skeptical because they seemed a bit outdated. But as we found out was that a lot of data, recent data on these type of um, things do not exist. So... A lot of them are like from nine years ago and, and the government doesn't, I think it takes time for them to do tests like this and like come up with something more recent. So that was definitely, that was definitely challenging, just finding something recent and that, that fit with the film that we were creating. Thank you. And finally, Hui Ying, you took up a lot of the technical aspects of the production. So like setting up cameras, um, you know, trying to white balance, trying to do everything else around that. So we know that we can't ever or don't want to control the environment anyways. But, you know, in field, you can't really control the environment when you're out there. Um, and one of our days, it was like raining when we, were, we went out to shoot. So just tell us a little bit about that experience and, you know, kind of like what leads you to that. Um, so like why I love filmmaking is um, because you have full freedom to manipulate like reality and, and just like everything. Um, and what I mean by that is um, somebody could, you could be interviewing them uh, for an hour, but then when you actually put it into the film, like you can really do whatever you want. And if they say this word and you associate it with another image, like people feel something else. Um, and so that's kind of like what I was trying to set up for, knowing that that's what like would come in the editing um, and how to do like extreme close-ups that people don't get to see in the everyday um, of someone else that they don't know um, or like really extreme close-ups of like, like all of us did this of like flowers, um, of things people were growing and like what it means to like um, film collard greens um, and then where to put that later in the film and like what we need beforehand um, so that that was kind of like my thinking um, in all of that awesome thank you um, and yeah my last question is uh, we all know that people of color in media are like underrepresented so I just want to know especially this project being led by women of color and gender non-conforming folks um, to tell us a little bit about what draws you to media and why and yeah I guess that goes back to your question, how uh, there are many minority groups who are underrepresented in the media. And um, I feel like with this space, we're allowed to do whatever we want. And that in itself is our representation, mm -hmm. the content that we create. So uh, by us just being able to come together and work with the cameras and, and uh, write the the scripts and edit the videos and show a bit a bit of ourselves in every project that we create. It's just a, a bit more representation. So taking ownership, definitely, yeah. 
definitely. Anybody else? Yeah, I, I would definitely like to add on that, um, you know, I come from a background where I always feel like women are oppressed. So it's like, at times like this, I feel like, wow, I have the power. Like, I'm creating something. I'm taking part in creating the narrative. So I feel like that's something really powerful for me. Thank you. Um, and I would say for me, like, media changes everything. Um, it can change how you think, um, like, as a producer and a director. And then you can also... Uh, create something that changes someone else's thinking or their consciousness and like once that happens and once that adds up like a lot changes um, and so that's what I'm committed to and it's like the creative work and and it's like thinking and realizing about how um, people of color in this country are majority of this world um, but there's so many like oppressions um, in the everyday in America um, and so like to be able to have the creative space and to talk about those issues and then to reimagine it. Um, and like like in our documentary, um, it wasn't just one emotion, it was kind of winding um, and it ended with like humor. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know, that that's like, wh like what happened there is kind of like representative of like what I try to do in life. Yeah, it's, it's up and downs and all around, yeah. <laughs> all right, um, so does anyone in the audience have questions? I can, you know, just pass you the mic. Or reflections. Or reflections, yeah. <laughs> Good evening. Good First evening. of all, everyone please give these beautiful, beautiful people a round of applause. The feedback on the camera there. What should I do? Like, just sit down? Um, <laughs> okay. I'm very, very super impressed with this documentary, and I feel like it's super, super necessary. I'm from the South Bronx, and it was only recently that I learned that the South Bronx is um, one of the most impoverished counties in the nation. Yeah. Forget New York in the nation. Um, almost about that's before Detroit, Chicago, all of those other um, counties. And you know, growing up in an impoverished community, and not having access to healthy foods and growing up and having all of these health issues, you, you begin to question and wonder why. And so I also feel that it's very, very intriguing to know that there, there are activists out there actually working towards empowering and, and educating their community. But it's so unfortunate that we don't have that access to that. We don't get to see those people every day. We don't see them on social media. We don't see them on the mainstream. Mm -hmm. So that's why I think that what you all did here today is super, 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 super amazing. Mm -hmm. And you all should be very, very proud of yourselves. And don't worry about the blemishes because you learn and you grow from that. And that's that's there's power in creating a short like this. Um, I really do hope that something like this becomes available to everyone and accessible to everyone because everyone needs to understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. The most empowering thing that I've learned from this is that there were um, lots being sold for a dollar and now they're, they're moving you know, a different demographic in, pushing another demographic out, pushing us into you know, the outskirts of the city mm -hmm. where we don't have access to healthy foods or lots anymore because now we're all around buildings, right? So thank you again. Thank you. I'm very, very proud. Like, I'm going to go home. I'm telling all my friends about this. <laughs> so, like, please make this available because I don't want to look crazy. Like, I want to show <laughs> people this. So thank you, ladies. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you so much. Uh, can anyone, like, let me know or let us know how this docu documentary, like, made you feel? D despite, like, all the stats and everything that you had just seen, like, how... What what did you get from this? What was what was the the end point for you? Hey, what's up, guys? That was so beautiful what you guys did, uh, Mili. Congratulations. Um, yeah, so I guess a takeaway from this and like the way that it made me feel, um, it's very nice to see youth getting involved and getting educated <laughs> on these <laughs> things. Um, I wish I had this knowledge when I was your age. Um, but yeah, I can only say that I'm happy that I'm seeing you know the young people um, getting informed on these things. But yeah, congrats on everything. Thank you. 
Mm. All right, so we were walking by school, and you asked me, you're like, oh, that's exactly where I could do my project, and we had just seen a community garden. <laughs> and I was like, what? What is she talking about? You know, like, <laughs> what is she on about? Because I had no idea what any of the project was, what was going on. She kept it hidden from me. And now, really understanding the aspect where you guys are coming from, it completely changed my point of view because everything the woman was saying, I was just telling Rain, my mother had everything. Mm -hmm. Hypertension, diabetes, you know, strokes, seizure, all of it. And in a way, it made me feel like I wanted to get my life together. I want to be that type of person where I can inspire other people and, and educate them on how illnesses are a real thing. Mm -hmm. Illnesses can kill you, and they will kill you because my mother's in the hospital passing away. Mm -hmm. And so it's honestly more so a blessing that needs to be shared with everybody because we have so many illnesses these days and nobody understands that the government is trying to kill us. Illuminati is real <laughs> and I'm not <laughs> falling for it. I really do want to start eating healthy. I want, you know, we have it right next to us. There's no reason why we can't start tomorrow. Mm -hmm. There's no reason why anybody can't start tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for sharing. And before we move on, I just wanted to say my condolences to you, Anna. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'll share a little bit about how it made me feel, but I also have a question. Um, so uh, I'm. It's just so f amazing to see. You know, in such a short film, how you were able to really drive in the point about our necessity to connect to the land, our necessity to be more uh, true to ourselves. And like we said, there are so many forces that have removed us from our knowledge, from um, even like how you mentioned that you make you reflect about where your family, where down the line, how they touch the land and being able to provide and be sovereign in their food supply and how this um, system has done everything it can to remove the essence of that connection because that is where the, the, the powers are able to consolidate, you know, capital, right? So, uh, and what does it mean to own land too, right? And how do we deconstruct that too? Because we never own land, we are of the land, right? We were of the land and we're not, we are supposed to have a relationship in indigenous communities. They say, you know, we're relatives, so we have all our relations, so we are all relatives, right? But we know that there's intricacies in, in, in how we, we are all see each other and how do we categorize each other. Um, and so that's part of like how we need to deconstruct um, and take back that knowledge and take back or relationship to the land, not, not even like take back the land, that always sounds a little bit possessive to me, but <laughs> you know, take, take back our relationship with the land. And I think it was very amazing how you were able to like all like drive that in like to the heart and be like, you know, and especially with the humor, I was like, yes, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, but I'm, I'm also like a, like a person that grew up like, um, in places where people grew uh, food and I still have those memories and coming to New York City and just like we always talking like to Brenda, like I just don't understand how people don't like, you know, how, not, not that I don't understand, I can see it, it's just sad that people don't have that connection to like nature as in other places because they, it, we have been so removed, this project of urban projects are something really that we need to look at uh, and and also, where was I going with that? Um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> um, th it was amazing, you know? So, um, yes. Um, and then I had a question. I'm also like a health advocate. So, and, and do work around, you know, went into public health because of that, but then also like um, hitting myself on a wall there too because of, of, of the systems uh, that control that narrative and like who controls the health conversation, right? Yeah. Who controls it? Who's the expert? Who who has the right to 
to um, to make recommendation or or uh, prescription on what you need to do to help them. And I think your film was able to to plant that seed about who has the power over over health, right? That we have the power over that, and it makes my like makes me chill. Um, I'm getting chills, but you know. Um, so I'm wondering the question because I had a question: <laughs> How is this planting seed in your relationships with your family and your loved ones? What are, is this something that's starting a conversation? And if so, what has that been? Um, during this project, I've had a, a lot of um, personal events that transpired. And so it was back and forth from like home life to like my internship and working on the project and, and um, uh, just going through the interviews and, and how they speak about rekindling our connection. And it, it, to me, it wasn't just like necessarily a connection with only the land. The land is where we were birthed from. So I feel like it was a connection with our community. Mm -hmm. And I if you if you want to like drag keep keep dragging the scale backward, it's our community. It's it's our it's our our neighbors. It's our family. Mm -hmm. And so with um, all the other goings on going on, how do you say that? Uh, with the um, information that I was consuming just by working on this project and trying to share it with you and co trying to condense it and, and make it uh, as concise as it could be, it, um, it revealed to me that, that, that connections are all we have, relationships are all we have. And so ev even those that we may have felt in the past we're lost, there's always some way to bring it back. There's always some way to heal from it. So I feel like I learned a lot from this project. <laughs> For me, it's more of a personal story. I'm going to be a little transparent here. But for me, I'm very insecure about my size. Like People comment all the time, oh my gosh, you're so skinny. So so for a long time, like I purposely eat McDonald's, Burger King, Popeyes, like I purposely eat those foods because I hope to gain weight. But just just hearing that there are really health related diseases out there and that people are people are getting harmed from eating these foods. It just make me think that, you know, I shouldn't be stuffing those food inside of me just because of a personal insecurity that I have. So for me, it hit close home to me. Just hearing you speak oh, so openly about your experience with that. It's just like I need to like rethink about my my eating habits. Um, for me, so my dad gardens a lot, and his mom, my grandma, also gardens a lot, and they just have like huge, always growing like vegetables and stuff, like just for just for fun, really. Um, and I've never gardened with them, like, ever. It was just like, oh, I'm going to sit in the living room while you go outside and you, you go, like, do your gardening thing. Um, but, like, I think, like, just last week, um, I my dad was gardening. Um, oh, okay, another side story. Um, my whole family is really into growing their own food. Um, just because, like, I think back in China, um, that's just how things were. Like, people just grew their own food, right? And so it's kind of unnatural to, to always be, like, traveling far to buy it. Um, and so um, Chinese people have an app called WeChat, which is the WhatsApp of, like, it's, it's like WhatsApp, basically. But <laughs> WeChat, like, everyone in China uses it. And as a result, everyone in the Chinese diaspora uses it. Um, so... My family is always texting each other like photos of melons and vegetables that they were just growing um, and like saying what they were. And I always thought it was so funny um, because like that's just not a social conversation anyone else in my life that I know has. Um, so my uncle gave my dad um, like a bunch of like melon plants um, to be planted. Um, and then I decided to like go out with him um, to the backyard and to garden. Um, and I just like saw how much <laughs> work it was um, and how I'm really just not cut out uh, for that labor because of how I was raised here. Um, and so I did end up planting like 
like six melons after like he was like hitting the dirt and like uh, making it fertile or whatever um, and my dad was like so happy he was like taking pictures of me um, because I think it, it was like the first time that I entered like this like gardening work with him and he was like so happy that he wasn't doing it alone um, and so for me it, it really is like changing my relationship uh, to my family and just to just like how I think about food and like where I want to go um, as I'm like living here with it. Um, one question I have is, um, is there any other way that you envision yourself, like, uh, taking as a next step outside of personal, I'm thinking, like, community-wise, like, are you planning on going to those community gardens, you know, getting involved in, I don't know, outside of your home, I guess, or personal relationships, what are other ways that you're envisioning yourself of continuing with this work? A lot of community gardens, and I, th I think we didn't mention this earlier, you can buy a plot of land and it could be yours and you can plant, um, plant vegetables, plant whatever you want and grow it. So I think for me, that'll be a first step, just even telling people in my community, like it's crazy that I'm part of the African community. I don't think any Africans in Harlem know that they can grow their own food. And that's something that, as the video mentioned, that similar to your story, that in Africa, a lot of us grow our own foods. So it's just interesting that none of them, I don't think they were aware that something like this exists. So I would definitely tell people about it and just encourage them to go buy that plot of land. I encourage all of you to also go, you purchase a small land in your community and just start growing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had actually signed up for La Thinker's email list. So they're gonna tell me when they have um, any more events and things like that, because I I really enjoyed enjoyed the space. It's it's really beautiful, guys. Like you guys should like really go out to the South Bronx and go visit La Finca. Like if nothing else, just go to La Finca. Like mm -hmm. it's such a nice garden. It's it has a bunch of plots in the front and it's like a bunch of like wood chips on the floor. But then you go to the back and it's like there's like this this canopy of like vines and you enter like this utopian garden in the back and it's freaking awesome, yo. <laughs> oh my god. But yeah. Um, I enjoy getting messy, like getting my hands dirty. I like mud and charcoal and <laughs> dirt. So yeah, I do plan on joining La Finca. I don't know how active I would be because I, I don't have a lot of time to spare, but gardening is fun. I had little plots of like little 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 dirt bowls and under my window. I kind of killed them, but. Uh, <laughs> Baby steps, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I'm making a public commitment to garden more with my dad. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I also just want to learn a lot more about um, healing work, uh, specifically like natural healing um, things. Uh, like after one of our filming days, Francis was like, do you guys want to take home sage and lemon balm? And we're like, yes. <laughs> and then so um, like she was starting to pick the plants and then teaching us how to pick them um, and how like when you pick lemon balm leaves, you pick the bigger ones, um, s which are ready to be picked. Um, and then the little ones then have room to grow. And I just like didn't know that you could think about the process like that. Um, yeah, and so I want to look more into just like natural healing like that and how I can like take part in growing that and then like promoting those ideas and then also just like promoting those practices. Yes. I want to challenge you all and I'm going to challenge myself to do this when this video becomes available <laughs> <laughs> to go to your community boards because you do have a community board, and those are the people who, you know, tell you all the information about the land and who controls this and who controls that. Go to your community boards, tell community leaders, tell your um, your district leaders, look look up those people um, and show them this. Go on Twitter, at them, hey, check this out. What are we doing for our community? How can we spread this information? Because remember, in information and access and education is key. I think Francis said that in the film. 
um, or, or Karen. They were saying that e education is, is empowering just as it is to do the work because there's a lot of people who don't know why they – why their parents have um, diabetes and why, like I was just telling Sylvia, like I just found out that dairy can cause eczema and a whole host of, of health issues that, and I spend my whole life eating cheese and I still, you know, I'm trying to wean off the cheese, but it's a process. <laughs> so um, baby, I steps. baby steps. <laughs> I want to challenge you all to really go out into your communities and tell these leaders like, look, our community needs this. We need to learn more and how can we change the conversation and the narrative yeah. because that's what you all are doing and that's what La Finca, uh, did I say right? Mm -hmm. That's what they're doing. You know, they're, they're trying to change the narrative and we need, that's why media is so powerful because media is like, we all consume it, right? We're all scrolling down our timelines. We're all watching TV at some point in the day. We're all seeing ads and advertisements. We need to ad advertise this. We need to market it to our communities. Mm -hmm. So I really want to challenge you all to get this stuff out there. Of course, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I also want to add the, um, adding to that, um, I think that we all really need to look into this $1 land thing. Um, Yo. Yeah, and I think like what happens with that is that there's all of these abandoned lots that for years are just like trash, right? And the government's like, you know, it's not valuable to anyone, so here, have it for a dollar. Um, it's like, it's I think it's just a, like a symbolic thing rather than just like giving it away. Um, and they never make anything accessible or in public information, right? You don't have like people flyering in the community saying like, oh, there's land available for a dollar. But what you do have is like those luxury developers being like, oh, wow, for $10, I can get all of this land. Mm -hmm. And then they start building um, like property and like condos and in um, like areas that people are just like not. Yeah. And just to add on to that, the tobacco industry has $10 advertising signs that you could get a pack of cigarettes for $10 when you could get a land for $10. So it's really trying to understand why is the system keeping certain things from us? Right. Why aren't they advertising? Why can we have our own land? Why do we see more liquor stores than advertising mm. to take back our community or advertising for farmers markets and things like that? It's really, really processing and, and understanding and keeping the wheels turning and the dialogue, you know, going. Mm -hmm. Again, I believe that's like another form of environmental racism, because uh, she she comes back to the the uh, tobacco ads. You mainly see tobacco ads in uh, low income communities and communities of color, and um, that's that's where they they pump these advertisements. That that's where it, it's really funny because tobacco causes cancer. It causes a whole bunch of uh, a whole slew of like health issues and things like that all these unhealthy foods burger king and things like that they cause a whole slew of uh, of, of health issues and things like that and, and it's being pumped into these low-income communities and only these luxury developers know about the about accessing these lands or purchasing these lands for a dollar and we have absolutely no knowledge of that and it's crazy because you were talking about going to our boards and speaking to these people but i think actually um Mayor de Blasio, he had, yeah, he had signed off on, on these $1 plots of land. Mm -hmm. And there was no media coverage for that whatsoever because they didn't want people to know. They want you to know what they want you to know. Mm -hmm. They want you to eat what they want you to eat. So it's like, it, it's crazy. It, it's, it's really just a matter of educating yourself and being aware of the environment and the country that we live in. It, it's it's crazy. Oh, I have a question. So you guys keep mentioning um, these dollar lots. Yeah. Um, is that, I know you showed the statistic in the video and it showed that this happened in 09? Mm -hmm. 09 or? 2014. 2014? Yeah. Is that still a thing then? Like you can get this lot for a dollar? Or like, I don't know the logistics of all that so land stuff. So the there's a website called 596 Acres. It's a nonprofit organization. So they keep track of um, vacant lots. And some of them are actually pending, meaning that they haven't even sold it yet, but they're in the process of selling it. But I think, I believe community members can intervene, right? Uh, I believe so. I believe. Yeah. I believe um, yeah. They don't know about it, right? But yeah. they can they can intervene and, and um, protest the selling of the land. So. Yeah. Yeah. And I also want to say the dollar land thing, it's not all just being lost. I know in cities like Detroit, um, like this dollar land thing is like not just in New York City, right? Like governments 
cities and local governments like learn from each other and do th they do the same thing. Um, but in Detroit, like a lot of people and community members uh, bought back the lands, and so there are a lot of community gardens and all of these art projects happening from the one dollar land um, that they were able to get back. Thank you. So let's give him one more round for <laughs> of applause for the going. Awesome. Alrighty, and I hope that you know you stay in touch with the Youth Media Center and that um, these type of screenings continue to happen. All right. Awesome. Yeah. Um, and last, we want to award you with a certificate of appreciation <laughs> 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 for <laughs> the Youth Media Center. As always, don't laugh. <laughs> Ari's laughing because she already has like five. <laughs> this is different. I promise. Yes, so I'm just going to read this one out loud. And it says, Certificate of Appreciation is presented to Aisha Kita um, for participating in Eminence Youth Media Center First Fellowship Program and creating socially conscious media. Yay. Next, we have Ariana Honoree. Ari! <laughs> Last. And then next we have Hu Ying. Hu Ying Bernice. And then last, um, a special certificate. Um, certificate of Appreciation is present presented to Ms. Brenda Leong yes. for leading the production of socially conscious media at Eminence Youth Media Center and empowering youth in our program to tell their stories while embracing and building with each other. Yeah, I want to say, like, Brenda is, like, the fourth fellow. Um, <laughs> like, she was just here throughout everything, right? So she was just, like, doing the interviews and the edited editing and, like, just this whole process with us. Um, so thank you, Brenda. Yes, thank you for coming. Thank you, everyone, for thank coming. You. Food in the back, um, yes. Stick around and eat food with us and take pictures. <laughs> um, can I request a picture with the audience? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I just want to, like, remember really who awesome. came. 